Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Curtis Johnson. I'm a member of the Seattle Extinction Rebellion. I'm also a freelance journalist. I write for, including for Truth Out. Um, I want to welcome everybody to our program tonight. And the, the title of our, our program is Confronting the Climate Extinction Crisis. Tonight's event is sponsored by Seattle Extinction Rebellion as well as Plant for the Planet. And first, we want to just acknowledge that we gather tonight on un unceded land and historic territory of the Duwamish people, who share the experience of millions of indigenous people worldwide who faced injustice and discrimination from this system and are still here. So to begin, to begin, as we gather here tonight, we face collectively on this planet an unprecedented crisis that threatens the future and even the existence of life. Our panelists tonight are gonna to get into the dimensions of this. But to state it very briefly, literally everywhere you turn today on this planet, there's a sign not just of decline, but collapse of insects and vertebrates on land, massive disruptions and dying off of life in the oceans, which is the basis of life on this planet. And scientists are increasingly speaking of the planet's ecology, you know, the whole means of maintaining life, being in free fall from climate disruption, from habitat destruction, pollution and pesticide use, invasive species, etc. And these factors don't just exist on their own, they're often interacting with each other and even causing unraveling in certain circumstances of the ecosystems that sustain life. All of these causes are products of human society organized as it is, where decision making by those in power is driven by profit and profitability, instead of human protection, survival, and the protection of ecosystems and species. And they do nothing to solve this threat to life. They only continue to make it worse. So we face a very scary and a very daunting situation. But there are also signs, very important signs of awakening. The hundreds of thousands of youth striking their schools behind the searing inspiration words of Greta Thunberg. Yeah, let's have, let's have a round of applause for that. And also there's been mounting protests and rebellion against the governments and system responsible for this crisis including those called by Extinction Rebellion worldwide April 15th to the 22nd, including here in Seattle, but most notably marked by determined and repeated mass civil disobedience of thousands of people in London. I hope people, I hope people saw that. But really huge que questions face us. Can life on Earth be saved or is it too late to really save anything? How do we even process and deal with the extinction of life and possibly human civilization? And very importantly, how can we go at this? How can we act and move people now to do everything in our power to save life or as much of life and our own species as possible? What needs to be changed? We want to address this tonight and we really want to grapple with these things together with you. So the way the night's going to run is we have three talks. They should run a total of about an hour and 15 minutes. And after the, um, after the talks, we'll have a couple of announcements. And then we, we're going to have a question and answer and comments from the audience. And we really want to encourage people to stay for this whole program. We want to hear people's thoughts. And this is a chance for us collectively to search for how to approach all this and what we can do about it. Uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome our first speaker. Curtis Deutsch is an earth scientist in the School of Oceanography at the University of Washington. His research is aimed at understanding the interaction between climate and ecosystems. Most of this work has focused on how the ocean produces, transports, and recycles the nutrients and oxygen that sustain its plant, animal, and microbial ecosystems over a range of time scales. He also works with terrestrial ecologists to understand how a changing climate affects biodiversity, biodiversity and biogeography. He is a fellow of the Cavalier Frontiers of Science, the Rosenstiel Award from the University of Miami, 
and an investigator award for the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. He was born and raised in rural Iowa and urban Seattle, loves music, the outdoors, and playing with his kids. Let's give a warm welcome for Curtis Deutsch. Well, thank you very much for the warm uh, welcome and introduction. Um, this is outside of my normal uh, lane. I spend most of my time doing scientific research and teaching and very little of it, actually acting on the things that I care deeply about in the way that I'm doing now. So this is quite exciting for me. And yet you'll still, uh, <laughs> before you clap too much, I should, warn you that there is going to be a fair amount of just kind of nerdy science in here because I can't escape it for one thing. For another thing, I think that, you know, life has this will to preserve itself and part of how we do that is by appreciating the beauty all around us and that comes in all kinds of forms. You can see it obviously by taking a hike in the Cascades, but you can also see it, uh, or at least I do, sitting behind my computer doing computations on large data sets and understanding how all these wonderful pieces fit together. So maybe that's just a good definition for ecology or for climate science or for both, especially when you put them together, you learn all of these wonderfully beautiful, sometimes abstract things. And I wanna share some of, you that, some of that with you today, but I also, in doing that, wanna paint a, a picture that many of you know, but hopefully will deepen your appreciation of that picture from a scientific point of view. And it really comes down to trying to understand um, aspects of the Earth system that I think help us, under, help us explain one of the largest events in the history of the Earth, which was the largest mass extinction at the end of the Permian era, about 252 million years ago. Sounds like a super remote event with not much bearing on what we're facing today, and yet what I'd like to do is argue that actually the similarities are quite uh, striking. Um, so here's a graphic that maybe will make more sense by the end of the talk, but for now it's just something pretty to look at. Um, made in collaboration with my graduate student, Justin Penn, um, who couldn't be here tonight, but uh, is very much uh, alive in all the figures that I'll show you. Um, so here's a uh, figure some of you may have seen. We've got a rough time scale going back uh, 500 or so years, um, just showing uh, cumulative uh, amounts of extinction. There are a number of lines here. The first one to pay attention to is the one that's dotted black here on the bottom. And that's science's best estimate of what rates of extinction, how extinctions would accumulate over time if there weren't anything extraordinary happening, just what we call the background or sometimes natural rates of extinction, something like you know, two species per million species years. It's a pretty slow process, extinction and speciation. The more important lines here, though, are uh, how the actual observed extinctions, not a hypothetical background rate, but the actual observational frequency of extinctions have taken, have accumulated over that time period, broken down roughly by uh, major terrestrial taxonomic groups. So we've got mammals and birds swooping dramatically up to the right here into the modern era. Uh, vertebrates as a whole in green uh, is the sort of the sum of mammals and birds, plus these other vertebrates, reptiles, amphibians, uh, fish. And you see that there's something obviously very much in common. They're all responding with high extinction rates, especially over the last two centuries. But interestingly, those extinctions uh, were well above background, in particular for birds and mammals already going back five or 600 years. So there's something about extinction that, although we're maybe uh, thinking about it more these days uh, and responding to it more, um, it's been around for a really long time. And by that, I mean the human-induced elevated rates of extinction. So that's important to keep in mind um, because the, su the subject of this gathering is uh, a related phenomenon of climate change, right? And you can see here one graphical illustration of the changing climate over a much shorter period of time, 
still the full length of, period of the time period over which we have real physical and chemical measurements of important components of the Earth's climate system, in this case, just thermometer records of the temperature of the sea surface and of the surface atmosphere, surface air temperature. And that shows you that there's a lot of variability in the climate, but nothing that, nothing that would account for uh, the rapid rates of warming here uh, shown on the top, um, roughly over the past century or so. Before that, climate wasn't dramatically warming in an observable way. So climate, even though it's clearly departed from the background norm of what we call the Holocene the last several, say, 10,000 years, that's been a much more recent phenomenon than the extinction trend that I showed you before. And what that tells us is that climate, although it may be an important component of, of extinction now, um, can explain the historical extinctions uh, that have been seen. So we have to grapple with climate, and yet climate isn't going to prove to be a sufficient uh, explanation for extinction. So now we've got two things. We've got this extinction trends that really started to ramp up well above background levels a long time ago, centuries ago. We've got climate that's just beginning to ramp up now, over the past century, let's say. Um, uh, and we've got these two things that are probably going to be interacting in their impacts on species. So let's think about, the, I like to use the metaphor of ripples on water because I'm in an oceanography department. And, uh, and it gets the idea across that you've all observed that waves can have interfe interference and they can interfere constructively. Two waves coming together to make a bigger wave it can also interfere destructively. One wave cancels out another. What we're concerned about, though, I think, is that these two waves, this, this perturbation to Earth's ecosystems that come about pre-climate change, that is from the direct interference of humans in the operation of ecosystems, land use change and introduction of invasive species and hunting and extermination uh, to extinction, those disturbances uh, that started a long time ago are ultimately going to collide with another force, this climate change force. And what we really need to understand and get our heads around is what happens to species when they start to feel both of those things acting simultaneously on them. Now, this is a very difficult problem because we're talking about what happens when two very complex systems interact, ecosystems and the climate system. Each of them alone is enough to occupy, and indeed has occupied thousands of scientific minds for decades and centuries. Um, and now we're asking the question, well, what happens when these two, these two forces collide with one another? What I want to do for the next 15 minutes or so is uh, set aside uh, this direct human disturbance and just focus on the climate disturbance itself and what that does to the structure and function of ecosystems. And the reason is that all, all of those, virtually all of those extinctions that I showed you in the first slide come from this piece here. Otherwise, they wouldn't have started 500, 600 years ago. They're the direct manifestation of human beings altering landscapes hunting things down, and so forth, absent any climate change. Climate is relatively young on the scene, and we don't actually have any very uh, well-known cases of documented extinction that trace to climate, but we can expect them to come. If we want to really get a, a good theoretical and, and empirical understanding, though, of how that works, we need to look at some case studies that, in which climate was clearly the cause of the extinction, and we can uh, exclude causes that come from direct human interference. So for that, we're going to look to the geologic past. Obviously, humans uh, weren't even a blip on this uh, picture here, um, which comes from a wonderful book by Elizabeth Colbert, I'm sure many of you have seen. Uh, in hundreds of ye million years before present, this is showing you the uh, total number of, of families, basically a measure of how diverse Earth's biota is and has been over time. And you can see a rather uh, striking kind of long-term, that is half billion year tendency to increase the complexity and diversity of life. And yet there are some rather abrupt interruptions of that long-term process in which uh, the overall diversity undergoes a rapid decline, not all the way back to pre-Cambrian levels, but really dramatic decreases in the overall diversity. 
Now, the most, uh, the most dramatic of those happened here at the end of the Permian. Um, and in families, it doesn't look as dramatic, but if you were to actually make this graph in terms of species, it's something like 90% of all species perished from the Earth at this time period. Um, and of course, the Earth has rebounded, but it, there are almost sure to be lessons here about what it was that caused that massive event. And there are a couple of things that are known. One is that there were, um, actually in many of these cases, um, in all of these cases, it's known that there were uh, periods of intense volcanism, volcanoes spewing all kinds of gases, including greenhouse gases, into the atmosphere that uh, over some time scale acted to warm up the Earth's surface climate. In addition, of course, you're all familiar with the end Cretaceous extinction in which we don't know whether volcanoes or an asteroid caused it. What I want to do, though, is forget about the other big four extinctions and focus on the, the mother of them all, the great dying, this end of the Permian. And that's because it's big, and so we can really get a good signal to understand. And it's also clearly driven by uh, this volcanism, the spewing of carbon dioxide and other volcanic greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So from the perspective of the oceans, we also have these various ripples, right? We put CO2 into the atmosphere, or the Earth did, back in the end of the Permian. And it creates a whole series of consequences for various parts of the climate and, and ecosystems. And as we get further away from that, uh, in, that central ripple, things start to get a little harder to see. As we get further away, the waves get a little smaller, but they can be uh, still detectable. So here's a variety of different things that people think of associated with the changes in the ocean when we add CO2 into the atmosphere. Uh, the most obvious one, actually, uh, although relatively late to be, under, to be recognized, is that seawater becomes more acidic when you add uh, carbon dioxide to it. <coughs> Um, the one that we've been focused on most as a scientific community is that temperatures of the surface Earth go up. That's the climate change piece, the increasing intensity of the greenhouse effect. That, of course, in the ocean can alter uh, currents within the ocean, the overall circulation of the ocean. Those are the sort of proximate manifestations of climate in the ocean, if you like. As we get further away from that central ripple, we start to see things like how those impact uh, light levels uh, available for plant growth, the nutrients available for plant growth, and critically for the rest of this talk, oxygen available for animal respiration. We're all breathing oxygen right now. All the animals in the ocean uh, need to breathe the oxygen in the ocean, with the exception of mammals who are getting it from the air. And ultimately, those three things, slightly one, one ripple away from the center, ultimately impact the plants and animals. So I'd like to just try to uh, show you what we, how we think that happened in, in this one enormous uh, event at the end of the Permian. So we refer to the impact of CO2 uh, as ocean acidification, and we sometimes refer to the impact of CO2 indirectly on the oxygen content of the ocean as uh, hypoxia. Okay, so just a couple of bits of terminology there. All right, so a lot of this talk is going to focus on what climate warming does to the oxygen content of the ocean, and it's not the most obvious thing, it's not the first thing that'll make the newscast about how climate influences ecosystems, and yet I wanna make the case to you that it's probably the most fundamental. It's fundamental and it's also, when you think about it, really familiar, because oxygen we think of as a gas, we're breathing it now, but it dissolves in a liquid in much the same way that liquid, like water, uh, evaporates into a gas like air. And the way that nature partitions the gaseous part from the liquid part depends on temperature. So you're familiar with this in a couple of ways. One is that we know that there's water suspended as a vapor in air because when air cools, it forms a cloud. And we suddenly see that all along there was water in the air, right? I love that. My kids just, they, they just go crazy when they hear this. They love it. It's there all along. So by the exact same physical chemical mechanism, the same thing is happening in water, except that to see it, we have to, uh, we have to do the reverse thing, which is warm it up. So as soon as we start, you know, put a pot of water for your oatmeal or pasta or whatever, and you start to warm it up, if you watch closely around the rim of the pan, you start to see little bubbles form, right? 
That's just the gas that was dissolved in the liquid. It was there all along, but you didn't see it until you started to warm things up, and those bubbles are going to come out, and they're going to deliver that, all the gases, including oxygen, back into the air. Right? So the partition of gaseous and, and aqueous phases of matter depends on temperature. That's it. Now, that's sort of nice and theoretical, right? Sounds reasonable. But we've got tons and tons of data to back up that that actually is happening in the ocean as we speak. So here's a picture of ocean temperatures on the left over time. Over the past 60 years or so, millions of measurements, literally thousands of scientists and, oh, countless hours. I don't even want to think about how many hours have gone into one simple curve like that because it requires measuring temperatures of the ocean over and over and over over a vast expanse of water that covers 70% of the planet. So you can just imagine how much time goes into that. At the same time, this, one of the other most measured properties of the ocean is its oxygen content. And when we look at how oxygen content, each one of these little dots is the oxygen content of the whole global ocean, or that upper kilometer of the ocean, in a particular month since the late 1950s, and what we see is that months of the last 60 years that had a higher heat content had a lower oxygen content. They had lost this much of their initial oxygen content. The, the fact that these points fall along a line tells us that the more we heat to the right, the more we fall in terms of the oxygen content of the ocean. All right, so that's one important fact. Here's another. As the water gets warmer, or air for that matter, Animals breathe faster. What we in science call the metabolic rate, that is just the rate of chemical reactions that give you the energy for life, they speed up. And what that means if you're an animal is that you need to breathe more oxygen to, to keep those reactions going. Oxygen and food, of course, are the fuel for, our, for life. And that's true for terrestrial species, it's true for marine species, it's true for virtually all species. The warmer their environment is, the faster they will consume oxygen. So now we've got a problem, because the warmer the ocean gets, the less oxygen it holds, and at the same time, the more the animals in it need it to breathe. So we've got things stuck between a rock and a hard place, supply is going down and demand is going up. Here's just a nice, pretty picture, less abstract, for the kinds of animals in, for which uh, experimental scientists have just measured how sensitive their respiration rate, their rate of oxygen consumption is to the temperature of their environment. Okay? And our study built, you know, we basically went back into the dusty library stacks and pulled out every single bit of that data that we could find. Many decades worth of lots of scientists working on this kind of uh, experimental data. And then we did, we use one more thing, which is another pillar of Earth science, and that is the ability of us to, re of our community to represent the physics and the chemistry and the biology of the Earth system in very large computer simulations. So this is one of those simulations that we did, uh, my graduate student, Justin, to be precise, uh, simulated the climate at the end of the Permian and then exposed it to a huge volcanic eruption and, and said, how much does the climate warm when that happens? Now, he didn't just make it up. He had some important empirical constraints on reality, and that is that fossil, the chemistry of fossil teeth give us a very important and robust information about the temperature of the water that the organisms producing those fossils were growing in. And so what we know is at the end of the Permian, temperatures in the tropical ocean increase dramatically in a very short period of time by something like 10 degrees Celsius. For those who think in Fahrenheit, something like 20 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a huge warming. Okay? And the climate model simulates that, but it gives us more than just what a couple fossils can give us. It gives us a full three-dimensional picture of what the climate was doing in association with that warming. And then we can do things like ask, OK, for the species that would have been living in any given place in that world that we've simulated, how would their oxygen demand have gone up, given that amount of warming? 
and how much oxygen, how much less oxygen would the ocean have supplied? Okay? Just a very, I'm distilling two years of work into a 10 second explanation. <laughs> and then we can ask things like, okay, for animals that vary in all kinds of ways, but in two particular ways, how sensitive their, re their rates of respiration are to temperature, and how, how much oxygen they, they breathe to begin with, that's this, oops, that's this x-axis, their temperature sensitivity, and this, the y-axis, is their vulnerability to low oxygen. We can ask, well, how much of their global habitat would they have lost? So each of these black points is a species for which we have the data from experimental work on the tolerance to warming and the tolerance to oxygen, okay, these two things that go hand in hand. And what you can see is that the vast majority of the species today would have experienced nearly 100% of the loss of their habitat okay, at the end of the Permian. If those animals were living back then, they almost certainly would have gone extinct. You can't really maintain a viable population in 1% of your habitat for most species. Now there's a lot of other species that don't lose quite 100%, but you know, over half. The vast majority of species experience extreme habitat compression. Now, we can ask things like, well, what would that have looked like in terms of extinction? So here's what the model predicted. It predicted high rates of extinction everywhere. Okay? If we just ask for the species that started off living in the tropics, how many of them went extinct? The answer in the model prediction was something like 50%. In the high latitudes, if they started off living in the high latitudes, those species went extinct even more frequently in this model simulation based on tons and tons of data they went extinct at rates of something like 70%, okay? Now that's extinction that's pretty severe everywhere, and the difference between 50% and 70% might not seem all that significant to you. I'll come back to that in a moment. But our first question obviously was, well, this is theory. What does the data show? So we took this result to our paleontologist colleagues, and they said, well, no one's ever looked at whether extinction was more severe in the tropics than in high latitudes which is kind of surprising. It seems like an obvious thing to ask. And they kind of scoffed, said, well, I don't, I don't think that will be true, but we'll look. And they sent us back within two weeks. It took us two years to make a prediction. It took them two, two weeks to test it. And this is the data. So that's what they sent us back, the red dots. Thousands and thousands of fossils collected, you know, since humans first started collecting fossils only recently put into a large electronic database, which makes the analysis take two weeks instead of two years. And it looks an awful lot like what the model predicted. Indeed, the most careful analysis demonstrates that the tropical organisms were less at risk of extinction by about 20% than the high latitude ones. Now again, this is not that meaningful from the perspective of just understanding the magnitude of extinction. Because if you, you know, I guess I would choose 50% extinction risk rather than 70, but I'd be pretty disappointed if you told me I had to choose one or the other, right? What's really meaningful about this is that it's a unique signature of the mechanism that did it. Because any other thing that you care to think about, or at least that we've thought about, that could have caused the extinction would not have done it with this characteristic geographical pattern. So what that tells us is that the, the, the so-called kill mechanism, the thing that did the extincting, was the combination of temperature and oxygen. Okay. Now that's important precisely because those are two things we know really well are changing right now out in our ocean. Of course, we would like to not have this be a purely academic exercise, so we'd like to ask, what does it mean for the future? And of course, the future uh, is not set in stone, but people have guesses about how quickly we'll continue to emit greenhouse gases. Turns out, it doesn't matter so much as long as we, if we can guess something about the rate the amount of warming, now when that happens depends on what we do, but if we put the future in the same, on the same scale as the Permian, 
So the Permian was way out here at 13 degrees warmer than, or the Triassic after the Permian was 13 degrees warmer than the Permian itself. That climate transition was a 13 degree warming on average. Here's what the future looks like if we continue a business as usual scenario relative to about the year 2000, 2100. It's a measly 2% warmer, but that's already a significant amount of uh, the local extinction. So globally averaged, if you, if you look in one place and ask how, many, how much of the species richness is lost on average in every place in the ocean once we reach two degrees, you're looking at something like 20, 25%, okay? And it just keeps increasing. The warmer you get, the rate of species loss of richness locally, once you globally average, just keeps climbing. The bad news is over. The good news can begin. And I'm only going to start the good news. Dar is going to tell you much more about what it is we can actually do. But I do at least want to leave you with one hopeful message, which is that those curves, although they tell us how much extinction we might expect for a given amount of warming, they cannot tell us how much warming we might expect. And the reason is that how much warming we should expect depends on what we choose to do. We all know that. That's why we're here, right? Here's a very concrete example. Again, building on this uh, pillar of the science community, computational climate system models. They allow us to explore scenarios like how much warming would we get if we emitted CO2 only until the atmosphere reached 450 parts per million, so that's the blue curve, versus a scenario that's more like the one we've been on historically, in which the atmosphere reaches close to 1,000 parts per million, over 900. And you can see that the difference in the temperature, the average surface temperature of Earth under those two different scenarios is quite significant, right? And if you, you could just translate that back, a one degree warming here, if we have 450 parts per million, is a lot less extinction than if we stay on our current trajectory out to 900 and some uh, parts per million. Okay. So the good news from the perspective of the Permian is nothing anyone can do about volcanic eruptions. But when we're the volcanoes, we get to decide how much to emit. It sounds like a trivial statement, and yet uh, resisting fatalism is the first step, perhaps. OK. What is the trajectory? The blue one is if we were to em emit CO2 but stop once the atmosphere gets to 450 parts per million. We're currently at like 410. So that's, that's a pretty extreme scenario. That would, that would take all of us deciding, like tomorrow, that that's what we want. Well, and beyond that, that that's what we're going to actually do. The other one is more or less, let's just continue what we've been doing. Maybe, you know, compact fluorescent light bulbs, but nothing terribly substantial. OK, I think that's all I had to say, except that if you put the pieces together, um, I would summarize it this way, that the anthropogenic extinction of species on Earth predates climate. And therefore, controlling climate change is not sufficient to solve the extinction problem. At the same time, climate appears extremely likely to be a massive perturbation to the persistence of major swaths of Earth's biota. And therefore, we can't afford not to stop climate change, which you put those two statements together, and I think it amounts to something like, this is a truly systemic problem. It's not about carbon dioxide molecules in the atmosphere. It's about now to take off my science hat and just put on my you know, human being hat. It's about a species way out of balance with its life support system, as I'm sure you all recognize. And of course, one, one last thing. There are ripple effects all over, and I'm hoping events like this are one, that 
we can throw rocks back into the pond and through education and all kinds of things. And hopefully they s expand out into people communicating differently, being more aware, creating policy change and personal changes in personal choices, and ultimately changing the culture that's led us here. And then lastly, I just want to acknowledge that um, your tax dollars paid for this. Um, and that is a statement that should not be taken for granted. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Curtis. Okay, now I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Dar Jamail is the author of four books, including Beyond the Green Zone, Dispatches from an Unembedded Journalist in Occupied Iraq, and the, recent, and the recently released The End of Ice, Bearing Witness and Finding Meaning in the Path of Climate Disruption. His stories have been published with Truthout, The Guardian, The Independent, Foreign Policy in Focus, Tom Dispatch, The Huffington Post, The Nation, and Al Jazeera, among others. He's a frequent guest on Democracy Now! and has appeared on BBC and NPR, among numerous other outlets. Jamal was awarded the Martha Gellhorn Prize for Investigative Journalism in 2007 for his work in Iraq, and in 2018 won an Izzy Award for Outstanding Achievement in Independent Media for his reporting on climate disruption. We're very pleased to welcome Dar Jamal. Thanks, Curtis. Thanks, Curtis, and thanks, Curtis. Um, so, uh, well, thanks everybody for coming tonight. And it's important for me to be here because I think what Extinction Rebellion is doing and what they're trying to do is extremely important right now. Um, so uh, we just got a great, uh, a brief but great kind of macro picture from Curtis about uh, extinctions and what happens. And so I'm gonna give you kind of more of a micro version of that on basically what, I'm, what I've seen playing out on the ground uh, right now uh, when I went around doing the research for this book. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about parallels between my first book and why I went to Iraq in this book. And so uh, I went to Iraq to report on a catastrophe that was happening to the Iraqi people because the uh, corporate media was not reporting it at all. And uh, it was really, really hard information. And, um, you know, like with the climate crisis, uh, a significant portion of the population in this country didn't want to believe it at all, that everything was fine. It was, we, we made life better for the Iraqi people. Uh, and, and then, of course, on the other side of the political spectrum, we had people that vehemently opposed what happened and what was going on, but there was a lot of denialism on both sides of those. Obviously, those that supported the war just wanted to think, oh, the US is the shining house on the hill, and we're gonna make life better for everybody. Um, and uh, no, we don't believe these reports coming out that things are as bad as they say. And, uh, but I, I'm here to argue uh, that even on the left side of the political spectrum of the people that uh, were against the war, and wanted to know what was going on, that wanting to know what was going on only went so far. When things started to get really brutal, and a lot of the things that I was reporting from Fallujah, for example, of what the US military was doing, that wanting to know kind of started to drop off. So, for example, I wrote a report from Fallujah. Um, some of what I wrote originally got edited out. I wrote about intentional targeting of women and children and ambulances and the elderly by American troops and snipers. Uh, things like intentionally uh, snipers shooting young Iraqi men between the legs. Uh, things like this. You know, this is what our tax dollars have done and continue to do overseas. And that kind of thing, like when I submitted the report to The Nation magazine, the magazine wouldn't run it, so they edited it real heavily and then ran it on the website. So there was a certain amount of censorship and denialism even on the left. And, and now years later, uh, 
I'm having a similar experience reporting on climate disruption um, with, with this book and with a lot of my, um, my, clim my monthly climate dispatches where, yeah, people, of course, on the left understand, you know, we're not going to argue science. You know, there's, there's not that level of denialism, thankfully. Um, but there is a pretty strong level of denialism in that um, there's a lot going on right now that I'll get into shortly that is kind of a left iteration of a similar denialism. Um, so uh, um, I want to just kind of go through some of the broad brush strokes then of, of what I found in the field. And in the, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into too great of, of detail uh, as I do with my book readings. So I just kind of want to cursorily go through a few of the areas. So for this book, I, I went around a lot of places in the world where I had a long-term relationship with the place, like the Great Bear Reef or Denali up in Alaska, so that I could go back there from 18 to 20 years later from when I first started going to these places and then really experience the dramatic change that's happened. Geologic level change happening on a part of a human uh, lifetime, time scale. And talking about glaciers cursorily. So I went back to Alaska and went to places where uh, less than 15 years earlier, I had had to hike up a two to 300 foot thick glacier to get to a particular mountaineering route. And then going back there in 2016 to work on this book and the whole glacier is just gone. And, 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 and really experiencing that in my body of what that feels like when this this huge important part of an ecosystem is just gone and you look up the valley and there's this like remnant of a hanging glacier up there and that's all that's left and there's waterfalls coming off of it. Um, and, then, and then similarly going back up on Denali and the Cahiltna Glacier which is the, the main glacier that you go up on the standard route has lost tens of feet of thickness. And this is a glacier that's in some areas more than half a mile wide. It's 40 miles long. So just, you know, you don't, you don't have to be a scientist to understand how much ice that really is in a very short amount of time being lost. I went to Glacier National Park and I went out with USGS uh, a research ecologist and director of the Climate Change and Mountain Ecosystems Project there, Dr. Dan Fagri. And this is a park that uh, when I was with him in the summer of 2017, he made international headlines by saying that uh, Glacier National Park by 2030 will not have any active glaciers. So that's less than 11 years from now. And this is a park that uh, just before it was designated a national park had 150 glaciers. And when I was there in 2017, it had 26 and it was accelerating. The amount of, of glacial and ice loss was accelerating. Numerous studies now show us that in our current trajectory of emissions and without dramatic immediate cutbacks, the, the contiguous 48 uh, US states will probably not have any functional glaciers by 2100. Um, if we look, if we expand out uh, most of the glaciers in the Himalaya, again at current trajectories, um, up to 99% of all the glaciers in the Himalayas will be gone by 2100, the highest mountain range on the planet. Um, the Hindu Kush region of the Himalaya, uh, this is where the, uh, a massive amount of the glaciers and a huge ice field are. It's also the source of where seven major Asian rivers are. Um, that, uh, that at current trajectories, uh, most of that, if not all of it, will be gone by 2100. And those rivers are drinking and irrigation water for 1.5 billion people. So where do those people go? And then what happens in the areas where they go? Is there enough water, food, housing, et cetera? So you, you see where this goes. And then the ecological effects, which are uh, extremely severe as well for plants and animals and fish and insects and birds. And I go into great detail in that in, in the glaciers chapter of my book. Um, Dr. Eric Rigno, UC Irvine and NASA affiliated scientists. I think he's arguably one of the leading, well not arguably, he's definitely one of the leading scientists studying the Antarctic. And uh, he released a, uh, a study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It came out this January. 
a six-fold increase in melting across the Antarctic since just 1970. Uh, he qu was quoted in the New York Times when that study came out saying, um, Antarctica is melting away. That's his quote. Uh, he had released previous studies saying that um, we're basically just going around seeing where all the bombs are because the fuses are all already lit, meaning that there's so much warm, uh, uh, there's been so much warming of the oceans and so many of these uh, tidal glaciers are melting from below on top of atmospheric warming that uh, they're coming unplugged, literally, like the glaciers that are in these valleys holding the, the brunt of the ice sheets up on the uh, land are, are basically, they're, they're all going to go, we just don't know the precise timing yet. So all of that is, is already happening and already baked into the, much of that is baked into the system already. And then some, some comments about sea levels. Um, I went down to South Miami to uh, meet with two of the leading sea level rise experts on the planet, uh, one of them an IPCC author. But one of them I want to talk with, talk about specifically Dr. Harold Wanless, professor and chair of the University of Miami Department of Geological Science. And uh, he, uh, he basically said, look, we, you know, we have these, these IPCC predictions and, and, or projections rather, and he took the IPCC to task and there's been a lot come out recently doing the same, one of them even a scientific study condemning and being very critical of the IPCC's consistent downplaying of the severity of the crisis that's already upon us. And uh, he, so Wanless says, look, the IPCC, I think their worst case projection for sea level rise at the time was, when I was there a couple of years ago, was I think one meter, maybe a little bit more than one meter. He said, look, he cited actually a study led by James Hansen based on paleo records showing, paleo climate records showing we could actually see a 10 foot sea level rise by as early as 2050. Wanless says 20 to 30 feet wouldn't exactly be out of the realm of possibility by 2100. And that sounds really extreme and really radical, and, and it is, um, but then when you start considering all the different feedback loops that are already locked in, um, one of the things to consider that puts that, those radical sea level rise in some perspective is that the oceans thus far have absor already absorbed 93.4% of the heat we've added to the atmosphere, and half of that since just 1997. To give you an idea how much energy that is, if, if the oceans hadn't absorbed that heat, the atmosphere would be 97 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it is right now. And so Wanless was really critical of people saying, oh, we can stop this, we can change it, uh, because he, he always said, how do you take that heat out of the oceans? You know, we, talk, we hear this talk about geoengineering and get used to it. We're going to hear a lot more talk about this because that's where things are heading because of uh, lack of action of governments today. But, you know, geoengineering, not geoengineering, whatever, how do you get that heat out of the oceans? Um, the last thing that he left me with was, he said, look, in the past, when we've had massive spikes of CO2 in the atmosphere, there's been a, a, a for example, he cited the coming out of the last, going into and coming out of the last ice age, when we had a 100, 100 part per million increase of CO2 in the atmosphere, he, we saw a corresponding 100 feet of sea level rise. And so I said, well, we had 280 ppm, CO2 in the atmosphere before the Industrial Revolution began. Now we have around 410. That was when I was speaking with him. Now it's around 412. Um, um, that's 130 ppm. So would that be 130 feet of sea level rise? And he said yes. So we have a, a, a huge amount of change already baked into the system. He said he didn't think we would see that uh, quite that high. But it is important to note that the last time there was this much CO2 in the atmosphere, according to one scientific study, um, uh, uh, terrestrial temperatures were, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, seven C hotter than they are today, and sea levels were 20 meters higher. Um, I'm going to skip over just briefly talking about just a couple of more broad brush strokes. The Amazon rainforest. Um, 
incredibly important for its biodiversity and how much water is there. 20% of the, the world's rivers are in the Amazon basin alone. The Amazon River alone has 1,100 tributaries, 17 of them longer than 1,000 miles apiece. Um, thousands of species of trees, uh, uh, over 2 million species of insects, thousands of species of birds, etc. cetera. Um, incredibly important place for biodiversity. And I, I got to go there with Dr. Thomas Lovejoy. He's known as the godfather of biodiversity. He's been studying the Amazon since 1965. Um, you can look up his resume. It's going to take you a while to read it. And um, he's a very, very stoic, kind of humble, quiet scientist, uh, extremely prestigious, his work. And uh, I spent a few days with him in, the, in Camp 41, a very famous research camp in the Amazon. And the only time I saw him get uh, upset or, or show strong emotion and raise his voice was I was talking to him about a op -ed, an op-ed that he wrote for the New York Times quite a few years ago warning uh, that we can't let global temperatures go over one, he was saying 1C, and 1.5C according to him was already too high. And so I started asking him, well, you know, there are these projections talking, you know, the Paris Accords are saying, well, 2C, but ideally 1.5C. And then there's a lot, a lot of scientists and some studies that show we already have 3C baked into the system, even if we did a full stop of all CO2 emissions on a dime yesterday. And then there's this, this study saying 4C and the IPCC worst case predictions, blah, blah, blah. And then there's some studies even talking about, you know, it's not out of the realm of possibilities of seeing 5, 6, even 7C by, by 2100. And I was kind of going up that ladder and he just slammed his ha hand on the table where we were sitting and he said, people have no idea what's going to happen here when we hit 2C. So just for perspective. And the Amazon already, uh, it's, it's so degraded. And again, the, the degradation that I'm going to talk about with this and then in the future, coming up with some of the species numbers, uh, uh, just like Curtis said, it's not only climate disruption, it's uh, habitat loss, it's hunting, it's insecticide use, it's said all these other human impacts as well. But obviously in some of these areas, uh, climate disruption is the prime driver. Um, tropical, tropical rainforests are already so degraded globally that, in, uh, that the Amazon are so, so degraded uh, itself that instead of absorbing emissions, it's now releasing more carbon annually than all the traffic in the United States. It should be sequestering year round if it's healthy. In 2010, there was a drought in the Amazon that released as much CO2 as the total annual emissions of Russia and China combined. Uh, there's 1.5 acres of rainforest being lost every second. The brunt of that from human encroachment and, and uh, deforestation. And at some point in the not so distant future, the Amazon will regularly emit more carbon than it absorbs this will be a huge and critical tipping point. Briefly talking about reefs, uh, I went to the Great Barrier Reef. At the time I showed up there, it was the uh, beginning of the massive coral bleaching event from 2017. Coral bleaching is what happens when um, the water where the coral is becomes too warm for it and the brilliant algae, the brilliantly colored algae that is on the coral is uh, becomes toxic to the coral, so uh, it uh, is ejected by the coral, so it doesn't die. And so the coral then turns bone white, hence the term bleaching. And it's a normal phenomena that occurs, but what's happening now with uh, human-caused uh, global warming is that there's increasing numbers of thermal events in the ocean. And in fact, the last five, each of the last five years has been a record warm year for the oceans. And so when I was there in 2017, huge swaths of the Great Barrier Reef were already bleached out. Uh, at least 25% of what bleached that year died. Similar numbers for the next year. And then now we're into another coral bleaching event. So when they're happening every year like this, coral simply can't recover. Uh, scientists in Australia have already, and there's been studies backing this up, have already said the Great Barrier Reef is now in its terminal stage. 
This is a World Heritage Site. It's the biggest coral reef on the planet, 1,400 miles long, and it's probably not going to be here in 10 years at current trajectory. A NOAA study in 2011 warned that if we keep going business as usual at current trajectories, there, there could be no functional coral reefs anywhere on the planet by 2050. Right now, scientists that I interviewed for the book think we're way ahead of that schedule. So I'm going to back up, give some broad brush strokes, and then uh, get into some conclusions here. Um, it is far too late to avert global environmental catastrophe. Like I said, um, there's a lot of science out there showing that we have three, a minimum of 3C already baked into the system under the best case scenarios if we stopped everything right now. Um, the other reason I, I uh, am a bit cynical about this is if you look out across the planet and you look at, and we can toss our government out the window because we're one of the worst as far as doing anything about it at this point, not the worst, but one of the worst. Um, but even the better places like some of the European countries that are at least going further in, in a better direction, we don't see anything like the kind of response that Extinction Rebellion is demanding is what would actually have to happen if we were gonna take serious the crisis that we're in and genuinely start working to mitigate what's happening. We would need literally something akin to a wartime response like alien invasion is coming to wipe out human beings. We need as a planet to get together and figure out how we're gonna, how we're gonna make it through this. That's the kind of response that would be in order if we had functional governments really responding to the threats at hand. But instead, we have business as usual continuing by and large. 2018 was the fourth warmest year ever recorded, with the only warmer years being 2015, 16, and 17. We're already in the middle of what's on track to be the warmest decade since record keeping began. Um, we are, according to at least one study uh, led by uh, uh, Paul Ehrlich, in the sixth mass extinction event that industrial civilization has caused for the numerous reasons that Curtis spoke about. Uh, we are injecting CO2 currently into the atmosphere, according to one study, uh, at a rate 10 times faster than what occurred during the Permian mass extinction event. And uh, again, uh, we this then bumps us up against uh, some of that denialism that I spoke of earlier. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about some things that I know some people in this room personally are working hard on, and I'm gonna be very critical of them, but then bear with me, I'm gonna come back around and, and, and say some other things uh, in a very different way about it. So one of the ideas uh, that I'm gonna be critical of is this IPCC report that came out in the fall saying we have 12 years to avert catastrophic climate impacts, and that was, an, that was a UN IPCC-based uh, report, and uh, there was no new data in the report. Um, we don't have 12 years. Uh, that, that information was pulled from assessments. Uh, the IPCC, some of the reasons you should be very critical of it, uh, the facts are it's a heavily politicized uh, organ. Uh, it's not pure science, not in the least. That's coming from IPCC authors. I interviewed a lot of them in this book. Um, one of them said, you can take the IPCC worst case projections and double them. That's from an IPCC author. Because it's politicized, because you have countries like this one that are drilling everything under the sun to produce more oil, they can weigh in and, and basically uh, put pressure on those future projections, discussions to keep them lower than what the science actually shows us where things are going. Also, a lot of the data in these, these assessments that come out every seven years, by the time they come to press, that data is over 10 years old in a lot of cases. Uh, for sea level rise, for example, Dr. Wanless said that we, we look at these IPCC criteria and actually they don't even begin to approach the actual percentages of sea level rise inputs from, for example, Greenland and Antarctica, which right now are, are two of the biggest contributors, if not the biggest, and they're grossly uh, underrepresented in the sea level rise projections. So that's just one example. Um, the New Green Deal, again, 
10 years, we have 10 years, we don't have 10 years. There's so much baked into the system. Right now, we need to be talking about adaptation. Some of that rhetoric, we can stop this, we can change this. No, we live in a new world now and we have to accept that reality. Um, I mentioned geoengineering, uh, the 2020 election, you know, maybe if we elect the right person, this is gonna change. No, none of this is based in reality. Um, one of the last couple of things I'm gonna talk about here before I get into shifting gears rather dramatically, um, it's been some, a series of studies come out recently about what's happening to insect populations that biomass of insects right now on the planet, we're losing 2.4% of the biomass of insects globally every year. So at current trajectory, assuming it stays linear, that means no more insects within 100 years. Insects pollinate 75% of our food, they're food for other animals, and they play a critical role in recycling nutrients. Uh, the short version of that story is without insects, we're not here. Since 1970, 60% of all mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles are gone. What would we call it if there had been a 60% reduction in humans since just 1970? Thank you. So the IPCC's worst case temperature scenario is 4 to 5C by 2100. There's been some other really stunning, shocking predictions. Uh, it seems hard to imagine them or that it would be possible, but even the International Energy Agency has stated that preserving our current economic paradigm could guarantee a 6 C rise in Earth's average temperature by 2050. Shell and BP analysts said that there could be as much as 5 C warming, but also by 2050. Um, my point is that when we look at all of this and pull all of this together, it's clear we are already in a nonlinear situation of climat climatic disruptions and their effects. Um, we are absolutely locked into a course of uncontrollable levels of climate disruption that brings starvation, destruction, mass migration, disease, and war. So there, there can no longer be any question that life as we know it is ending. We are going to be living on a new planet going forward. <clears throat> we are already. So I've just rushed through a whole bunch of this, and, and I want to wrap this up, my part of this talk now, with addressing that feeling of, of hearing all of this really, really hard, heartbreaking information, really, and how scary it is and all the other feelings that come with that. Um, I've had to go through the rage that you feel looking at these people. You know, we're, now we're going to drill the Arctic. Now we're exploring the, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Where else can we drill next? You know, the, you know, when you picture those faces in your mind, you know who they are and the feelings that come with that. And then the fear of, you know, just thinking about this. What does it mean if we lose all this terrestrial ice, what, is it, what does it mean if we lose the insects, et cetera? All these feelings, um, it really brought me to a point of crisis uh, in this book, much like what a lot of climate scientists get to contend with. Um, but it, thankfully, working on this book also brought in people into my life, some of them scientists, but uh, one of the more important ones uh, for me personally was a Native American elder named Stan Rushworth. He's of Cherokee descent. And he reminded me of something that is my current MO right now of how to deal with this crisis, which is, he pointed out that there's a, a mainstream culture here, there's a settler colonialist mentality of what are my rights? What are my rights? But in indigenous cultures, they believe we're born onto the planet with obligations to serve the planet and take care of the planet and to, to do my, take actions uh, safeguarding future generations of humans and all species. And so if I get up each day and I'm thinking, oh, what can I do and, and you know, or, or what are my rights rather and, you know, what can I do and maybe to what result, I am inevitably going to be disappointed, to put it mildly, especially looking at the gravity of the situation. And instead, if I get up and I think, okay, how am I going to serve the planet today? And what do I need to do to try to safeguard future generations? 
then I've got my work cut out for me. And there's every reason in the world to get up and do something. So uh, another thing I want to point out, because you know, we're, we, we, we're faced with this paradigm now of hope versus hopelessness. And I'm very critical of hope, and I get into that a lot in the conclusion of my book. But to kind of sum up my perspective on this and where I try to come from today, I quote a Czech dissident writer and statesman Václav Havel who said, hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something is worth doing no matter how it turns out. So I want to, um, thanks. And I think that's the place, it's kind of a new ontology that we get to start coming from, especially in an activist community. And um, so to, to wrap up, I'm going to um, read a, um, a story and then uh, a, a, a couple of quotes. Well, actually, I'll read, I'm sorry, let me reverse that. I'm going to read a couple of Wendell Berry quotes and then, and then a story and then close out my part of this. Wendell Berry said at one point, protest that endures, I think, is moved by a hope far more modest than that of public success. Namely, the hope of preserving qualities in one's own heart and spirit that would be destroyed by acquiescence. Again, a very, very different motivation. Another one, it may be that when we no longer know what to do, we have come to our real work. And when we no longer know which way to go, we have begun our real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded stream is the one that sings. I'm going to read a story that Stan shared with me. It came from his, uh, one of his elders and teachers, uh, Dr. Daryl Wilson, uh, who's from the Pitt River Nation of Northeastern California. And I'm going to read this to make sure I don't miss a detail. Wilson tells of Mis Misa, a small but powerful spirit that inhabits Akuyet, uh, what white man, the white man named Mount Shasta. The name is Akuyet. It's located in the southern end of the Cascade Range in north central California. Mis Misa is a spirit force that balances the earth with the universe and the universe with the earth. Wilson says that Akuyet is, quote, the most necessary of all of the mountains upon earth, for Mis Misa keeps the earth the proper distance from the sun and keeps everything in its proper place when wonder and power stir the universe with a giant yet invisible canoe paddle. Mis Misa keeps the earth from wandering away from the rest of the universe. It maintains the proper seasons and the proper atmosphere for life to flourish as earth changes seasons on its journey around the sun. The mountain, the story tells us, must be worshiped because Mis Misa dwells deep within it. To climb the mountain with a pure heart and with real resolve and to communicate with all of the light and all of the darkness of the universe is to place your spirit in a direct line from the songs of Mis Misa to the heart of the universe. While in this posture, the spirit of man, woman is in perfect balance and harmony. For as long as Mis Misa's instructions are followed with sincerity, society will be sustained. Its inhabitants will survive for the long term. The most important of all the lessons, it is said, is to be so quiet in your being that you constantly hear the soft sing singing of Mis Misa. However, the story also warns that by not listening to Mis Misa's song, the song will fade. Mis Misa will depart, and the earth and all of the societies upon earth will be out of balance, and life therein vulnerable to extinction. So, for me, when Stan told me that story last June, it really lined up for me. This is why I've always, I, I go into the mountains, uh, that's my, regularly, that's my preferred place to go to listen to the earth. And when I heard that song, I knew that's where I go to le listen to Mis Misa. And it's still where I go to, to stay sane amidst what's happening on the planet. So the thoughts I'll leave you with uh, to send you home with, I hope, is our two questions. Where do you go to listen to Mis Misa? And when was the last time that you've been there? Thanks.
Can you hear me? Okay. Again, I want to urge everyone to hang around because this is really, you know, and I know people know a lot of this, but for me, when I listen to Dar, it's a whole other level. <laughs> and I really want people to hang around because I think we have to collectively talk about the, this, this question of where things are at and what can we do about it and what kind of approach should we have. Okay, now I'm going to introduce our next two speakers uh, for ex uh, Seattle Extinction Rebellion, Shailen and Ruth. Shailen Stoke, on the left, earned a bachelor's degree in botany from Amherst College and a master's of statistics from the U University of Glasgow with a thesis on modeling the effects of climate change in marine ecosystems. After completing her master's, she worked in the renewable industry designing wind farms throughout Scotland. Her experiences and inherited knowledge as an indigenous person also inform her work in activism. She is enrolled with, with Clan McNeil of Bara in Scotland and is patrilineal kin of the Waiu Nation's Apushona clan in Venezuela. Ruth Oskolkoff, to her left, earned a bachelor's degree in literature and a master's in humanities with a thesis on sacred space. She also possesses a certificate in poetry writing from the U University of Washington and has published two works of poetry. An Alutic tribal member enrolled in the Ninilchik Traditional Council. She served on the shareholder committee of the Alaska Native Corporation Cook Inlet Region Incorporated. She's been car free since 2000 and spends her spare time as an activist on progress progressive issues. Welcome Shailen and Ruth. Hello everyone. I'm Shailen. I'm Ruth. And before we get started, we wanted to acknowledge that we are all on land that has been inhabited and cared for by the Duwamish people since time immemorial, and to engage in the spirit of joining them in that duty of care. I would like to offer a short prayer. Tata Malewa, Chayakai Iyapinwa, Kojishasiya, Piyu Waitama. Kasa Chaji, Kojudun, Piyu Sukchima, Wayu Supisha, Shia Juchung, Chiajaka, Iyu Nunu. We're from Seattle Extinction Rebellion. And we're here to tell you that your greenish, granola, woodsy, liberal, bikeable, lovable house is on fire. Now you're thinking, OK, if it's an emergency, we can do this. We'll invoke JP Patches, call Mayor Durkin, get Shama Sawant down here uh, to march with us, uh, make our governor, I don't know, do something, because uh, what can we do all by ourselves? Our other speakers have talked a lot about climate change on a global scale, which can be a bit hard to process and think about in a concrete way. So let's talk about some changes you may have noticed right here in the Pacific Northwest. For example, salmon, populations are dropping. Salmon need abundant water to spawn and it needs to be cold or their eggs are not going to survive. And as temperatures rise, fewer and fewer streams are suitable for salmon. And our recreational and commercial fisheries aren't the only ones being affected. It's been all over the news that our iconic orcas in Puget Sound are critically endangered. They rely on the salmon for food and now they're slowly starving. You probably remember the big BC wildfires from the news last summer. The lack of rainfall due to climate change means more areas are vulnerable to fire. The dryness also means the fires have more potential fuel and burn hotter. <coughs> we didn't even have to be in the path of the wildfire to be negatively affected. Last summer, Seattle's air quality was one of the worst in the world, just because of the fires. 
Now, you just listened to a lot of detailed science on the climate extinction crisis from our last two speakers. But we'd like to address some very serious misinformation about what we need to do right now. Let's address some of these myths. <clears throat> Myth one, the average person is causing climate change. We're sure you've seen the finger wagging article shaming you for causing the climate crisis. If you just carpool and stop using straws and stop eating meat and bike everywhere and get energy efficient light bulbs, we'll fix climate change in no time. While our collective choices can be important, making small lifestyle changes isn't enough. Just 100 companies, primarily in the fossil fuel extracting industry, are responsible for over two thirds of all CO2 emissions. The five worst polluters cause more than a quarter of all excess CO2. The rest of the top 100 are responsible for half of all emissions. You can see agriculture is just 9%. Yes, sustainable farming practices are important, but farming is far from the biggest bad guy. Seriously, Donald, no one is banning cows. Now, these emissions do ultimately prop up a lot of unsustainable lifestyle choices, but that responsibility isn't shared equally. The lifestyles of the richest 10% of people cause half of all CO2 emissions. A member of the 1% causes 175 times as much CO2 emissions as someone at or below the poverty line. So for all of you who didn't fly to this event in your private jet or get chauffeured in your limo, you're not really the main problem. You're off the hook. <laughs> Myth number two, governments are making policy progress on climate change, so we'll be fine. Sure, we've been making baby steps forward, but current climate policy, for example, Germans, Germany's Coal Commission compromise, has only a 5% chance of successfully staving off a worst case scenario. That's worse odds than winning big on a single roulette wheel spin in Vegas, and we're betting the future of all life on Earth. Now, we've just given you a lot of scary information. The other folks on our panel have given you a lot of scary information. So we're just gonna ask you to sit, and process it for a moment. Take a deep breath. But we promise we have some good news next. Because we have one last myth to debunk, myth three. We can't solve climate change. We can't turn back the clock on the damage that's already been done, but we can prevent total climate collapse and keep the earth habitable. Dr. Christopher Smith and Dr. Nicholas Stern from the University of Leeds in the London School of Economics have calculated that if we begin a dramatic shift from fossil fuels to renewables right now, we have a two out of three chance of heading off climate collapse. Indigenous people worldwide are already working nonstop to save the planet. These are Lakota water protectors. This is one of the most famous instances of indigenous people opposing fossil fuel infrastructure, but they're certainly not the only ones. Globally, indigenous people are less than 5% of the world's population, but are protecting 80% of its remaining biodiversity. Right now, Wet'suwet'en land protectors are defending their homelands from a giant pipeline. The Puyallup Nation is blocking a dangerous natural gas plant from being built on their homelands in Tacoma. But we can't do this alone. My name is Greta Thunberg. I am 15 years old and I'm from Sweden. I speak on behalf of Climate Justice Now. 
Many people say that Sweden is just a small country and it doesn't matter what we do. But I've learned that you are never too small to make a difference. And if a few children can get headlines all over the world just by not going to school, then imagine what we could all do together if we really wanted to. But to do that, we have to speak clearly, no matter how uncomfortable that may be. You only speak of green, eternal economic growth because you are too scared of being unpopular. You only talk about moving forward with the same bad ideas that got us into this mess, even when the only sensible thing to do is pull the emergency brake. You are not mature enough to tell it like it is. Even that burden you leave to us children. But I don't care about being popular. I care about climate justice and a living planet. Our civilization is being sacrificed for the opportunity of a very small number of people to continue making enormous amounts of money. Our biosphere is being sacrificed so that rich people in countries like mine can live in luxury. It is the sufferings of the many which pay for the luxuries of the few. The year 2078, I will celebrate my 75th birthday. If I have children, maybe they will spend that day with me. Maybe they will ask me about you. Maybe they will ask why you didn't do anything while there still was time to act. You say you love your children above all else, and yet you are stealing their future in front of their very eyes. Until you start focusing on what needs to be done, rather than what is politically possible, there is no hope. So, what do we do? Meet Extinction Rebellion. Extinction Rebellion is an international movement of nonviolent civil disobedience against the corporations and governments that have created the climate crisis through willful destruction and inaction. So why are we doing nonviolent direct action instead of just calling our Congress people? Can't we just vote for all the right politicians and have them fix it? Because we've already asked nicely many, many times and the government has completely failed to address this crisis. Our politicians, even many Democrats, are too invested literally in the corporations that caused the climate extinction crisis in the first place. Historically, nonviolent direct action has been an effective tool and strategy for underexposed or marginalized or unpopular causes to be heard. This photo is from the US Civil Rights Movement. And when it was taken, only about 40% of the US population supported their cause. And now we take it for granted that we can go to the same schools and sit side by side on public transit or vote without taking a rigged literacy test. This is the Iceland women's strike. Their action turned Iceland from a gender equality backwater to a gender equality leader in Europe. This is Gandhi and his followers occupying the Indian parliament to demand independence. They succeeded in 1947. These are South African children skipping school to protest apartheid. Their action invigorated the movement to end apartheid in South Africa. We hope that Extinction Rebellion's building global campaign of direct actions will have the same success in the fight for climate justice. Extinction Rebellion has spread from its origin in England to dozens of countries around the world, including chapters in Australia, South Africa, Brazil, Ghana, India, and Seattle. Now, we know you're thinking, wait, this is Seattle. Seattleites are nice and polite 
and would never go shut down a bridge or occupy corporate offices, right? Well, we need to act on climate change. If we don't get out there and occupy that Starbucks in 10 years, Whoa. coffee won't exist anymore. And if we can't get out in the streets to defend coffee, do we even get to call ourselves Seattleites? Extinction Rebellion has three key demands that we believe will allow us to stabilize the climate crisis. First, the government must tell the truth about how deadly our situation is. Second, the government must enact legally binding policies to reduce carbon emissions in the US to net zero by 2025. Finally, a citizens assembly to oversee the changes so that the future is in all of our hands not the control of corrupt politicians who work for oil companies. <laughs> Amen. Uh, you can make a difference. Uh, I know it's easy to think your lone voice doesn't count, but by joining us, you're not a lone voice anymore. This is a global movement. There are chapters in 200 countries and counting with at least one chapter on every continent, except Antarctica, coming soon. We, the people, have immense power together. And we have the opportunity to use that power and save the world for ourselves and our children and many generations after. So if you want to save the orcas, if you want to ensure a habitable planet, for your grandkids, or if you got really scared when we talked about coffee going extinct, come and join us. We've got sign-up sheets at the door. And this Saturday, we are hosting a meetup at the Montlake Library at 1130 for anyone who is interested in learning more about Extinction Rebellion and getting involved. This is, we are all on this planet together, and all of you can do something to help. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so uh, now we're going to have our question and answer and comment period. We want you to be able to make a comment about this if you would like to. We would like to keep those comments short, like maybe a minute apiece, so that we can have, you know, and also you can ask questions of the panelists. Um, but we do what we're, this was confronting the climate extinction crisis, and we have a lot to confront. We're not going to do it all tonight, obviously. But we do need that process to start. So we want to encourage people, if you want to make a comment or if you have a question, to line up over here at the mic and uh, fire away. Um. I look at this like a teaching that's so extremely important. And, you know, I think all of us need to be ready to spend a whole weekend and a whole year having these meetings every single day. And I, I like to see that as we're in the streets every single day, talking to each other and building unity to save this friggin' pl this planet. I'm getting a little emotional, but, um, you know, I think we all have to confront, like, what people are saying here. Is there a chance to save this planet, the world, and from a scientific basis, which a lot of what's been said tonight, I'm not even sure if, if Dar thinks there is a chance. I know Extinction Rebellion thinks there is. So, I mean, obviously that's something really important we need to talk about. And we live in a country that is the leading cause of this destruction. Probably everybody in the room thinks this is true, but I think we have to understand that very deeply because the US is the number one emitter of these emissions of causing climate change, and it's because it's a sole superpower. So one thing is I think we have to address what causes, why it's a systemic thing under capitalism that we have this going on, and how are we gonna end that short of actually ending the capitalist system? That's a huge question, but I think we all have to confront that 
and the possibility of actually ending it. Right here in this country, we have a regime that is very fascist, it is fascist, and I think what Extinction Rebellion is doing is very much what Refuse Fascism also calling for people to do, calling for people to get out of their comfort zones, confront what's going on, be willing to put themselves on the line, not just one day, even every t once a month, every single day we need to be out here. We need to struggle with all our friends to confront the reality of what's going down in this country. We have little children in cages being tortured. We have refugees created by international capitalist system that's also created this huge problem for the planet. And I could go on and on, but we need to get together. I'm so glad this is happening, but you know, this is just the teach-in part. We need to have huge meetings all around the world. And the governments are not gonna come to their senses. We have to demand everything we get. They are not gonna come to their senses. They represent the capitalist system. Thank you so much. I hope everyone will read this plan that Refuse Fascism has been fighting for for two years. It's simple but very complex. Put yourself on the line, get millions of people out in the streets with you, and demand that this fascist regime must go. They are the ones calling for the drilling of Antarctic. Nothing is gonna fucking stop until we get Trump and Pence out. Thank you, I'm a little emotional, but thank you for doing this teaching. Okay, come to a Refuse Fascism meeting. We're all in the same boat together with the refugees and the people of the world. Thank you for letting me talk so long. Okay, does anybody want to address that or from the panel or do want to, should we go on? I can speak to it briefly as a socialist activist. Okay. I, I think that she has a good point that all of the um, social movements, whether they're against the fascist government or for rights for minorities or LGBTQ or immigrant work, it's all eventually, we've all got to join forces and demand that our government make changes. And if we all join together, we have a better chance. That's all I want to say. I take heart in the quote that for Vaclav Havel that uh, Dara mentioned. Could you get a little closer to the mic, Larry? Sorry. Yeah, I'm uh, taking heart from the Vaclav Havel quote that uh, we don't, that hope is doing the right thing without knowing how the result is going to be. So I feel we don't have to answer the question, can we save the civilization from climate change or not, we are doing the right thing. I wanted to add a little perspective from Tom Hartman who wrote uh, The End of Ancient Sunlight, and he's just recently revised that. Uh, it's got a new edition out, but his, com his, his uh, uh, thesis is that civilization has always been run on solar power and uh, whatever, what drove uh, the sailing ships and uh, the horsepower that drove civilization up until the fossil fuel age was all based on the sol sun's effect, creating winds and bringing, grossing grass to give muscle power. And uh, all we did uh, was we dug up some sunlight from uh, 200 million years ago, and we've done this as a, turned out to be a perversion, uh, because uh, we have 173 trillion terawatts of energy reaches the Earth every day, and now we've got free sunlight. All we have to do is convert it to the energy that we need, and uh, that energy level is 10,000 times what the uh, civilizations of the world right now consumes in energy. So uh, we c I, I think we should make that point uh, to the people who say that uh, we can't run our country on, on, uh, without fossil fuels. We've uh, wasted uh, 30 or 40 years 
digging this expensive stuff and, and running a dangerous system where we should have been converting a long time ago to free energy. And panelists, f feel free to jump in <laughs> if you want to comment on any um, of these things. Coming from the renewable sector, I know there's some skepticism on can we put together the infrastructure, can we do this quickly? And when I started working in the renewables industry in Scotland in 2010, 2011, the government had a plan to get us to um, full renewable energy by 2020, and people were saying, oh, that's never gonna happen. It was just um, less than 5% of the energy was coming from renewable sources, and it is in the first few months of 2019, Scotland was running at 98% renewable energy, and um, fossil fueled vehicles are going to be completely phased out by 2035. This is a tiny country that is occupied by a colonial government, so the parliament doesn't even have these full powers that they could have. It's a country with less than six million people and a lot of extremely remote areas to put in infrastructure and was able to do that in less than 10 years. If a country like, you know, a small country with limitations on their power and not as much infrastructure as, say, the United States or China can pull that off, there is no logistical reason that we can't do the same thing. It's essentially choosing not to, not this can't physically be done. In 1942, Roosevelt shut down the American auto industry, and in six months, they were turning out 10,000 tanks a month, and by the end of the year, they had produced 88,000 aircraft. And uh, there's no reason we couldn't do the same by uh, changing to wind chargers and solar systems and uh, we wouldn't lose any uh, jobs. We can just develop the political will to make the same, uh, you know, all we had was a world war to face in 1940. That's chump change compared to what we're facing now if we could just convince the powers to be that it needs to be done. Yeah, thanks. We should, we should, you know, I want to, we, we want everyone to be able to talk, so try to keep it to that, and then we're not going to have a back and forth between the panelists and then responses, so go ahead. Um, I'd like to ask a question that uh, any and all of you I'd love to hear an answer from, but I guess I formulated it for Dar because you spent the better part of the last two decades uh, telling people things they didn't want to hear and that were actively being suppressed. Um, and I would like to know any advice all of you have, any strategies you've found success in. Um, how do you motivate people to tell them that you have a stake in this? And how do you do it without being condescending? And then additionally, there's a lot of people that I'm sure do think about this and aren't here tonight or aren't out at other Extinction Rebellion events because they are just trying to feed themselves right now. So how do we account for all of that uh, in, in one question, I guess? But Well, um, thanks for that. And just real quick, um, I have learned that folks that don't want to know, trying to give them facts and information and all that, that's, that if they don't want to know, they're, they're not going to know. And so I don't waste time on that. And, and so I, I think there is great value in preaching to the choir. And, uh, but 
but I guess my response to that is that I wrote a book in a way that's really, really personal and really human of just what it felt like to go to these places and see this. And then I backed it all up with tons of scientific data and reports and citations and such and went into the field with scientists. But ultimately, it's just here we are. This is what's happening to the planet. This is what it feels like, looks like. And, and that being out there, I know that there's been a couple of parents of a couple of my friends who've read the book who were deniers and that the, the, it got them like the book got them because it's really emotional and it really you know and I so I think just really connecting to people on a really human level of just this is what's happening you know and and um, this is this is how it feels to me you know and that that's been I think my biggest asset in this work after having tried to like kill them with the facts beat them, you know, beat them with the hardest information there is, and, you know, that doesn't do the job. You know, it's really like we're all in this together, you know, and this is, and this is what's happening, and, and, and then just being really emotionally honest about it. Thanks. I uh, wanted to start with a comment and then a question to the panel. Um, I want to give some, some hope back to the crowd here. Uh, there's actually five, Get, there's five closer groups to the mic, meeting Michael. tonight. Closer to the mic. Awesome. There's actually five groups and events happening tonight that's all circled around climate change. Um, I wanted to give some hope back to the crowd that people are starting to wake up to it. Uh, the flip side to that is they all decided to meet on the same night. And there's a lack of coordination <laughs> happening right now. Um, and that's kind of some of the encouragement that I want to give back to the crowd is we need to collectively form this citizens assembly that's talked about with Extinction Rebellion that would be there not just to make this change, urgent change happen, but also to, like Dara says, catch society when it does collapse. When a billion people do decide to migrate, are we gonna let those Border Patrol agents fire these people down? Or are we gonna accept them with open arms? And so my question to the panel is, what was it like when you had that epiphany that this was something that you needed to get out in the streets for? Um, and Curtis, you had mentioned, you spent years teaching about this subject and only recently you decided to start acting and doing something about it. I think that's all of us right now, is we're all deciding, okay, it's time to take some action. Can you guys speak to that moment that you made that decision and what uh, you started to do to make you know, change happen? And then Dar, to who the, the question of the Citizens Assembly, do you see that being what could catch us from a billion refugees deciding to all migrate north? Uh, let's see, can you hear me? Um, I guess in some way I'm, I'm thinking back on what I said earlier. I'm sort of returning to action after uh, a, a great deal of discouragement. During graduate school, the Iraq war started and um, I was not embedded, but I, I was, um, it took a year off and you know, uh, did as much as I could to prevent it and felt, ended up feeling very, um, discouraged by that experience. I, think I sort of retreated into teaching a bit. Um, and that's been, I find a lot of uh, optimism in teaching because, you know, um, students at this university and in others where I've taught the, um, the interest in actually doing something about climate and other big, you know, uh, ecological issues is, is very strong, I would say. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I forgot where I was going with that. But I, but I do find teaching and, and um, uh, the interest among, you know, university students now to be incredibly inspiring. And evidently, you know, extrapolating from Greta, uh, the young Swedish woman, it's only going to get better. I, I think for me, my motivation has to come from love, to cut to the chase, you know, love of the planet and love of, you know, the, the people in my life and, and the future generations. I mean, the thing right now to me that, like, you know, the students in, in looking at that, like, if, if that's not going to get you out of bed and get you on the streets to work with those kids, I don't know what is. 
Um, that, to me, is one of the most profound things I've seen in a while of this international and growing uh, protest of kids. And, and, you know, that speaks directly. It's like there's the future generations begging, you know, for us to work with them, you know. And that's one of the things that, you know, I got taught by my native elders of, you know, there it is. What are you going to do? You know, what are you going to do? And it comes down to that. Are you going to get up and, and try to try to serve the planet or not, you know? And, and so I, I share all this really intense, hard information, and it's really hard to take in. Um, with the caveat, we don't know what's going to happen. You know, we've never been here. And as bleak as things look, there's that more, I always come back to that moral obligation is what, what am I going to do? You know, just like what Greta said, you know, like, what is she going to be able to tell her kids, you know? that she did during this time when we still had functional biosystems and there were still glaciers in the lower 48. Like, I, you know, I want to be able to tell 20, 30 years from now, you know, I want to be able to tell kids, yeah, I fought like hell. I was, I was doing what I, everything that I could, you know, and I changed my life from it and everything. And, and the other thing too is just at the risk of being a little bit self-centered that, you know, doing the work of this book, which ended up being just this huge service for the planet, it literally has changed my life. And it's literally had me go from being this depressed, angry, F it, we're too late, it's over, to I know what I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing now. You know? And it's brought all these incredible people into my life, and it's given me this deeper meaning, and it's completely changed me from the inside out. And that's just from taking the action. Because that's another thing that Greta says, is action is the antidote to despair. You know, and we have to just let go of the results, you know, because if we're results oriented, especially in Trumpistan right now, we're going to be, you know, a bit depressed and disappointed. So it just keeps c coming back to me as like, what's the right action? What's the right action? What's the right action? Hope that helps. Hey, thank you all very much. Uh, and thanks for this event. I have a critique, a problem with one of the messages here that is coming from all over the movement, not just from this room. You've all heard it and you heard it again tonight. And that is that um, you're not the problem, it's systems, system change that we have to have. And I'm gonna tell you that that's complete bullshit. And I can prove it very simply with the chart that you showed us tonight uh, that showed that 49% of the greenhouse gas emissions come from the wealthiest top 10% of income earners worldwide. 68% come from the top 20% wealthiest worldwide. Well, that seems to prove just the opposite. That it's, that, it's that 1%, right? Except that every person in this room, in fact, every person who has a residence in western Washington is in the top 10%. So don't tell us you are not the problem. Every person in Western Washington who has a residence is in the top 10%, which is creating 49% of the greenhouse gas emissions. Right. So, yeah, of income, of wealth. So I guess my point is that the, the big green groups have fed us some lies and we tend to believe them. Like with wildfires, we tend to believe them. We don't have a problem with wildfires, we have a problem with property fires, where houses are built badly in places where we had forest and then we know the wildfires are gonna double, which they need to do because climate is changing and these ecosystems need to evolve and they regenerate when there's a fire. So there's, there's certain things that we're believing and that we're repeating as climate activists that are gonna get us in trouble because we will never stop the corporations that we continue to patronize. We just won't and that is what Greta has been telling us. She's telling everybody she talks to, whether you're at Davos or whether you're at the UN, Stop polluting. What are you doing? Flying around the world, what are you, what are you doing? So I, I guess I want to challenge everybody here, and I'd love to hear response or thoughts about 
um, what it means to not just be like in the US where we put you know one fourth of all the greenhouse gases in the air, but to actually be in the top 10% that is creating this problem, saying we have to have system change, we have to have political change, and continuing to consume, in what year will it not be okay morally to continue consuming at the rate we are? Um, I, I like to, um, make a response. So when we talk about lifestyle choices, sure, cars add up, plastic adds up, our food systems add up. But when we showed you that chart, that's globally. All of us who are not Exxon, uh, if there are any Exxon CEOs in the room, like, but seri in all seriousness, though, um, that approximately 24, 25% of emissions, that was sort of the other there, covers all of our driving. It covers all of our plastic manufacture. It covers food getting shipped around. It covers our electricity. So even if every single one of us turned off all the lights in our house, never used a car again, never rode a bus again, never touched anything plastic again, stopped buying produce and grew all our own food, that would only take out about a quarter of carbon emissions. And again, that would be every single person in the world would have to do that. And that would only cut 25%. So yes, our choices matter. Yes, our consumption matters. But put, running around policing plastic straws we're saying, well, if we carpooled, that's the real thing, is missing the biggest source, which is fossil fuel extraction run absolutely amok, and the government systems that are allowing them to do this. And I'd also like to note that a lot of these projects are not actually turning a profit, or their margin is extremely, extremely small. If you look at the stats for, say, the planned Trans Mountain Pipeline, was bought out by the Canadian government after being declared financially non-viable. So that tells you that's not a supply and um, a one-to-one -one supply demand issue either. That is something deeply systemic that the government stepped in, the Canadian government stepped in and spent over $4 billion to bail out a financially non-viable pipeline. That's not us consuming that, that is an interaction between the government and the fossil fuel companies. And we need to take care of that on a whole other level. Uh, I'd like to just clarify maybe something I said, which was uh, about needing systemic solutions. I didn't intend to offer that as a, uh, in opposition to personal responsibility, which I try to also take very seriously. Um, I think it's important for people to make personal choices that they would like to see reflected at higher levels of social organization. We should, you know, as the famous saying goes, be the change that we want to see. I believe in that. Um, what I meant to say, though, was that um, I think it's also important not to uh, view the problem through too narrow a lens and view it as just, you know, something about the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as opposed to uh, a much broader problem, which is that we're, a, you know, a fraction of a species is appropriating virtually all the productivity of an entire biosphere. And, um, uh, and that's done in the service of maximizing GDP or or what have you, which 
is the system that I think should change, and that will only change if, you know, I stop flying so much and uh, stop making the choices that cause ExxonMobil to keep pumping. I mean, if I stop buying, if we all stop buying fossil fuels, they're not gonna keep pumping it. They have to sell it to someone. So I think it, you know, these things, there's not, it's not an either or to me. We have to work at all levels on ourselves, on our families, on our cities, on our countries, on the cultures that are reflected at all those level, levels. I don't, I don't wanna separate those things out, really. Um, I'm having a tough time forming a question, lots of thoughts swirling around. Um, uh, just to bookmark two things, I guess. Uh, one, one question for everybody, uh, something that I think is essential, um, is changing our government by running to hold positions of power, elect people that we support. Um, and so I wonder, there was, I know uh, there's something said from the Extinction Rebellion standpoint uh, is that we've tried that, we've asked politely, we've asked politely, but uh, we're, we're starting to see a little bit of change in, in our government, especially with this, this new Congress uh, in the United States. And so that's one thing, what people's perspective is on um, uh, reform of, of our system by, by you know, uh, supporting people we think will we'll, uh, be bold or uh, running for office ourselves. That's one thing I'm thinking about and curious to get everyone's take or whoever wants to speak. Um, and, and I guess to speak maybe more to that, oh yeah, oh yeah, there's a time thing, thanks. It's hard to see that. Um, I get, well, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. I'm encouraged by the number of Green New Deal shirts I've seen tonight. <laughs> My 10 seconds. <laughs> and I guess I would encourage Extinction Rebellion. I'm, uh, I'm uh, just quickly, I'm a hub coordinator with the Sunrise Movement on the Olympic Peninsula. And I'd, we don't have an Extinction Rebellion on the peninsula uh, yet, but I would, uh, if you haven't already reached out to the folks in Seattle, uh, let's, let's work, work together, so. Uh, thanks everybody for coming, all, all the panelists. Um, I, my question was actually asked earlier and now I know what to do with my 80 your old dad who says, drill, baby, drill, pump, baby, pump, all that oil out of the ground, Dar just told me I shouldn't even bother, should I? <laughs> Lost cause. So I'll, I'll put my efforts into somewhere else. But, um, but I would like to say, again, thank you to the whole panel, and uh, specifically thank you to Dar for writing your book and braving that snowstorm to get to the studio to talk to democracy now, because that's where I saw you, and then I found out about the book and read the book. Uh, so thank you very much. And um, I wanna say uh, thank you to Extinction Rebellion. Uh, all the activity that's been going on in London has been truly inspirational. The nonviolent action, um, I do believe it's needed and in, in, in order to get people to, to get our governments and our, our uh, policymakers to move, uh, that sort of action is going to need to be taken. Thankfully, the Green New Deal shirts are showing up. There was a meeting over across the way, and the whole room was filled for the Green New Deal talk. So it definitely feels like positive movement is, is moving along. So um, try to end it on a positive note instead of drill, baby, drill. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, shoot, I hope you can hear me. Uh, yeah, we need a culture change. I agree with what was being said earlier, and I think that that does start with us. Starts a lot uh, with the ways that we move. We've been talking about movements and people moving, and we see Greta and the youth moving and getting attention from those movements. Um, because people care, a lot of people care, a lot more people than are 
came in this room tonight care, and we know that. Um, but how do we get people to tap into that agency to move together, you know? Because that's where change happens, when we come together and we move and we dance together and we change the narrative of letting these top dogs run without um, disturbance, you know? So I heard, I heard someone say the other week, when, when we act, when we share, that thing becomes alive, that possibility of hope becomes alive when we move together. So uh, I guess to wrap this up quickly, you know, we talk about we need to move. Who is we? You know, that's us here. So how, I guess I have a question for Extinction Rebellion. Um, is things like your meeting tomorrow, is, is that when people meet up to talk about these performative arts movements that we can do together to draw attention of the media, of people in our city of Seattle that also care but don't really know where that community is or don't really know like how to get involved. I just want a, a clear answer of like how often do you meet up? When do you plan those things? And how can all of us here get involved in moving together right now like we see the youth doing? Um, I'm a, a university student at the University of Washington Bothell and I'm really trying to grow community around environmental justice right now because what we need to be doing is moving, not just thinking about it. We all know this is hard. We all know that. And people are really feeling a lot wanna, more pain than we you are. You want to go for this one? But we need to be oh, acting as well, you know? Um, and we should be joining the kids. There's another climate strike next Friday is the next climate strike, 10 AM. You can look it up and find more details about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, actually, I think it's on like Pioneer Street and Occidental. Or something. Yeah, hey, there we go. Yeah, look it up, and we're marching this time too. Wow. I know it. Let's grow the community. Yeah. Yeah, Friday, ten o'clock. Look it up. Next, next week. Um, it's online. But that's how it starts: is by us sharing it, and it becomes alive. So I, sorry to wrap this up. Is that what the meeting tomorrow is about? Is how we can get together and move? Yes. Um. We have weekly meetings, and this particular meeting on Saturday is going to be focused on new members, people who are interested in joining the group, and really focused on generating more ideas and more outreach. And I'd also like to remind everyone that while all the direct action of the people in London with a big boat sitting in the street and stuff, that gets a lot of attention, but if that's not how you see yourself in the movement, if, you know, for whatever reason, you know, you can't be out there. Yeah, you need, we, you know, you've got to, people made those banners. People painted that boat. People wrote all those press releases. There are so many support roles. There is something for everyone to do. So just come to the meeting. Check it out, then go and tell everyone you know. <laughs> Thank you. One, th one thing I, maybe I can add on that, this group is really an open, you know, it's very open in terms of, hey, if you think, if you like these demands, you can have a lot of different philosophies and ideologies, but we can all come together to make this change, and that's what we have to do. And one of the things we discussed after the April 15th action is how do we get in position to do what they did in London? And I've, things need to go beyond that, honestly, right? The UK is still burning fossil fuels, so we need this to be worldwide. But one thing that is really good about Extinction Rebellion is they have this thing about we need everyone and every part of everyone. And that's a real thing. So there's room for everybody to be part of that. And we've got a lot of strategizing. We've got people who are brand new to Extinction Rebellion in one week who are leading parts of, of the work. And that's the kind of group it is. Um, thank you for being here and presenting this. Um, I just wanted to ask, I think there were many um, vicious circles sort of presented tonight in terms of like, like loss of ice and warming. Um, what are there any virtuous cycles to that you can discern like from looking at this a lot um and in terms of those i think about like a social movement gaining momentum and i also think about green energy industry but that also is tied to another kind of logic that maybe we need to jettison um 
so yeah, and I'm prepared to hear that there are none. I mean, I, on, the, on the scientific side, I would say, so that there, when you say vicious uh, circle or cycle, in science we refer to those as feedbacks, and they tend to either take a signal and amplify it, or they take a signal and they damp it. And the climate system has lots of feedbacks of both types, and um, it, we're in a climate state now where the amplifying feedbacks tend to be stronger than the damping feedbacks and that depends on the starting point you're in, but that's part of why climate is, as you know, climate warms up with a little bit of, CO, of extra CO2 the way that it does is because of these amplifying feedbacks, and those are relatively well understood, um, and they're sort of part of the, part of the problem. Um, the social feedbacks, I'll let someone else speak to, please. Can you repeat the question about the social feedbacks? I didn't quite understand what you asked. I mean, it's kind of vague, but like, are there, I mean, in terms of directing energy towards like specific changes, what, what things are gonna give us kind of like more energy than we put in? What are like gonna be the most effective like pressure points? Let me, let me see if I understand what you're asking. You're asking about um, creating social movements and how we're gonna do that? Is that what you're asking? So um, a lot of it revolves around the demands. Um, we're not just like going and doing things in the street and trying to get attention. We're actually making demands on the government. So that's, is that kind of what you're asking about? And so um, I know that um, in Extinction Rebellion, a lot of us are coming from different political philosophies. Some of us are anarchists, some of us are socialists, some of us are liberals, um, but we're all coming together in this movement to make demands that we all agree upon, and hopefully we'll draw in other people in other movements that are similar and make similar demands. And uh, of course, um, it's going to take millions of people, as Bernie says, to create any sort of systemic change, And but I think, um, Climate change touches every single person on the planet, whether you're liberal or conservative or right wing or left wing or independent or don't care. It's going to touch these people, and people are waking up to that, I think. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Hi. Uh, so, something I noticed from listening to the speakers and the people who were commenting. Uh, is that there's a, a conspicuous lack of the word class being used. And I think that's really interesting given uh, something very didactic that uh, you said, Curtis, which was that a fraction of one species is consuming, I think, I don't remember the exact words you used, but the majority of the, the wealth of an entire planet. And you know that applies to the bottom chunk of that species as well. And that is the primary concern of, of social movements for you know, the last 200, 300 years and going back further into human history. And I think that it's a lot easier to convince somebody that, um, say, if you have to work uh, 60 hours a week just to feed your kids and pay your bills, it's a lot harder to, to get motivated to uh, care about something like climate change or even to let that into your, your mental space. Um, and so when we meet people on their level with their needs, um, it opens up new doors. And as far as um, I think the last commenter said about social feedback loops, um, that's one of them, is that when you meet people on their level, then your movement grows. And you know that, that feeds itself, because then those people uh, have some on the ground understanding that you previously did not have. And so, no question, but I think that, yeah, when we can't separate uh, the needs of the planet and the needs of climate, um, and to address this, the, these challenges, um, apart from the challenges we've already had as a species, because we have this rich history uh, of, of social movements here in Seattle, you know? Um, the WTO protests uh, were pretty tremendous, and those happened uh, about a month after I was born. I never heard about these <laughs> until my 19th birthday, and I came across a book in a public library. And this is, this is something that's been driven out of our public memory, but is very much there. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't um, compartmentalize these movements. They are one and the same. 
So thank you. Did anybody want to say anything? You guys are good. I just wanted to um, give a shout out to Mad Relief, Mutual Aid Disaster Relief. They came out of several disasters, uh, Ferguson and several hurricanes and things, and came together. They did a talk um, across in Seattle and across the United States, and it's basically a system for coming together to mutually help each other in whatever disasters are going on. It's, they have a platform online, and it's mutual aid disaster relief. The, I went to the talk in Seattle. It was really, really informative and a good collective, so it's a place to look. Okay, I guess we're going to wrap it up then. Um, I did want to, I just got a, an announcement from someone here in the front row that said, let me get my glasses. <laughs> Last Friday at 1 p.m. at Seattle City Hall steps, students gathered to bring attention to addressing climate disturbance and want to be joined at 1 p.m. tomorrow and so on. So that's another thing that's happening, apparently. Um, 1 p.m. tomorrow, Seattle City Hall, students gathering. So um, I want to thank our speakers very much for coming and joining together. It was, it was an interesting night. Thanks to all of you. And I, I definitely want to extend a, uh, extend a hand to everybody to come to our meetup, which is Saturday at 1130 at the Montlake uh, Library, Seattle Montlake Library. There'll be snacks. <laughs> There'll be snacks. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet out here, too, if you want to sign up to be in touch with us. Um, this has got to carry forward, right? We've got to go much further than we are right now. So um, this is a beginning, though. So thank you. <laughs>